Welcome into episode number 10 of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Dean, broadcaster and communications coordinator for the Advanced A affiliates of the Houston Astros. Now we're a week away from the opening day for all of Major League Baseball, which comes down on July the 24th. Of course, those couple of games the night before, day before on Thursday the 23rd. The Astros, as we've said, will open up their 2020 season, the abbreviated 60-game sprint, a week from Friday uh, against the Seattle Mariners. So finally looking uh, forward to that, starting to see opening day starters being named. And we'll get into a few news and notes tidbits to start out the podcast today before we preview our pair of guests. And the biggest one, no surprise, Justin Verlander officially named the Astros opening day starter. He will open against the Mariners uh, next Friday night uh, as the Astros play in front of the fanless crowd at Minute Maid Park against Seattle. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's officially set yet, uh, but this week Dusty Baker kind of said that it might be Lance McCullers Jr. That's the plan anyway right now to start Game 2. Uh, at the time we're recording this on Thursday, the day prior, Zach Greinke is supposed to start uh, here on July the 16th in a sim game, and he would uh, start Game number 3. appears to be the plan uh, for the Al the Astros rotation uh, is shaking out early this year. Who's going to be in the back end rotation is kind of the big question. As we mentioned, Urquidy uh, has not yet been at camp, so you can assume that uh, he will not be uh, beginning this season and factoring into the rotation at least initially. He's on the 10-day injured list right now, as is the reigning uh, AL Rookie of the Year, Jordan Alvarez. So a couple missing uh, bats, or just the one we should say, and Alvarez, a couple of missing pitchers, should figure to give some opportunities to a lot of talented young pitchers in the Astro system, several of which played for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers last season. We've mentioned guys like Brian Abreu, Christian Javier, and Anoli Paredes on the podcast before. They are just three of the 13 on the Astros' initial player pool. It's really important to look who's on the 40-man roster, as in the regular season. That's going to give you a good indication of who has the best chance of making an impact at the big league level this year. Those are just some of the names that will come up uh, when we sit down with our guest for this week. He is the pitching coordinator uh, for the Astros system. Bill Murphy, uh, our guest on this episode of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. We know the Astros minor league system is really pitching heavy, really have an emphasis and a knack for developing uh, some electric power arms to the fans in Fayetteville, of course, got to see last season. So we will talk with Bill Murphy about some of those exciting arms that the fans got to see in Fayetteville this year, guys that have a chance to make an impact at the major league level this season. We are still uh, working on getting in touch with a few former Fayetteville Woodpeckers from last season, but this week, a little bit of a shift. We will talk with a potential future Woodpecker uh, that we might see in the next couple of seasons in a Fayetteville uniform. The Astros' second-round draft pick from last summer, June of 2019. That is Gray Kessinger out of Ole Miss. Heading into the year, the Astros' number 10 overall prospect in the system, according to Baseball America. Uh, Gray Kessinger, in interesting time for him. Uh, we haven't talked to any minor leaguers yet whose season is essentially over, uh, but he is really a good mindset, really positive to talk to, and uh, just kind of his whole approach uh, to how he's preparing now for 2021, and maybe some of that time he could be spending in a Fayetteville Woodpeckers uniform. Couple housekeeping items before we get into our two interviews we're excited about for this week. Uh, a announcement to our fans in the Fayetteville community. Uh, until further notice, the Woodpeckers Bird's Nest Team Store in-person hours will be suspended. Curbside pickup, which is previously been an option on the online team store. That's going to be set aside temporarily. Curbside pickup will start back up on July the 28th. Uh, a store reopening date for in-person hours, uh, which the Woodpeckers we had going on with social distancing and masks. Uh, that will be put on hold until future notice. Uh, right now, just trying to keep the fans, the staff, and the community safe. Being a little bit uh, over-cautious uh, rather than under-cautious at the moment, so promoting social distancing and wearing a mask. Uh, but the 
team store right now. In-person hours have been temporarily suspended. You will have the option on online orders, which, of course, we still encourage you to head out towards. Curbside pickup will be back on July the 28th. I uh, also want to make mention of the Undefeated Season 2020 t-shirts that are now available. Uh, you can find that on the online Bird's Nest team store. Uh, check it out on the Woodpeckers Twitter and Facebook accounts. $20 for an Undefeated Season t-shirt. Uh, now the Woodpeckers officially uh, can say that they were undefeated in 2020, a record of 0-0. We sold over 100 of them in the first 48 hours after putting them on sale this week. Uh, we hope they're still available at the time of this podcast drops Friday afternoon. Uh, but if there are still some available, they are few and far between. So head out to the online Bird's Nest Team Store for that new item now released for the undefeated 2020 season t-shirts for $20 a piece. All right, then the last thing to hit on before we head into our first interview, our Woodpeckers Rewind moment from 2019. Uh, for this week on uh, episode number 10, uh, it spans the week of Sunday, July the 12th through Saturday the 18th. It comes from July 14th when eight of nine Woodpeckers collected hits and another dominating pitching performance from Sean Dubin and Brett Conine held Potomac to just four hits as Fayetteville edged the Nats 3-1 to one at Segra Stadium. The former Fullerton standout Conine most impressively fanned eight of the 13 hitters he faced out of the bullpen and recorded the final five outs that he made via the punch out. A 3-1 to one Woodpeckers win over the Potomac Nationals at Segura Stadium. Our Woodpeckers rewind moment of the week from July the 14th. Without further ado, we'll send it over to our first interview of episode number 10, a conversation with the Astros' second round pick from 2019, Gray Kessinger. <laughs> All right, I'm excited to welcome my next guest. He is the second round pick of the Houston Astros back in 2019 out of Ole Miss. He was an All-American during his junior season in 2019, the Brooks Wallace Award winner given to the nation's top collegiate shortstop. Coming off his first professional season, he got in 62 games between single-A quad cities, short season Tri-City. We are happy to be joined by the shortstop Gray Kessinger on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. Uh, Gray, thanks for being here. I was saying just before we started recording, uh, we're looking ahead towards the 2021 season, uh, and we're starting to talk to some potential future Woodpeckers, so we appreciate you taking the time. Sorry that you are the second installment of the future, guys. We already talked to Matt Barefoot, but we're happy to have you on for number two. I oh, appreciate it. It's also weird to hear you say 2021. What happened to 20, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just forget about this year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, speaking of 2020, uh, just help catch us up. You, you had that little taste of pro ball uh, last season after the draft. Where have you been staying in the off season? Uh, and, and who are you staying with? What, what have you been doing, I guess, off the field besides your preparations now uh, for the future? So finished up, uh, finished up last season and um, went home for a little bit back to Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, that's where I grew up. And then um, I guess I came down to Florida near our facility to start working out at Eric Cressy's place at Cressy Sports Performance. And I worked out there uh, in November, went back home for December, and then starting the new year, I just moved down here. So I've been down here in Florida, Jupiter, West Palm area, working out at Cressy's place. And yeah, that's where I've been, just trying to stay ready down here and <laughs> just doing the same thing every day, just lifting and hitting and waiting to hear something. Yeah, it, it sounds like you've had good fortune of, of having access to equipment, facilities. I mean, you, you have you been in, interacting with some of your, your teammates in the org? It's kind of different situations from some of the guys I've been talking to, but but uh, how good has it been to like have the access to the facilities and equipment? Has that been the case the whole time since last season ended? It's been good. So when this COVID stuff first hit, I guess, um, everything, you know, kind of shut down. So that's kind of went back home for a little bit just because there was no point in, you know, being here and just couldn't do anything. So I went home for a little while and then um, I heard Krusty was kind of opening back up. And so then I just came back down here and was able to get back in there, and they were scheduling time. So I was still able to not miss too much working out, not miss too much hitting, which was great. So I haven't really had to, you know, play too much catch-up or anything. And we've been able to keep doing some, like, live ABs and stuff down here. So I've been seeing some pitching, some defense, you know, 
just doing enough to stay ready. So if they say, hey, we can do something in a couple of weeks, I'll be ready to go. But that's been big, um, being able to find a place that's relatively stayed open because the Astros facility hadn't, hadn't been open. They haven't you know, been allowed unless even for a little while, it's only the 40 man guys. So yeah, I'm lucky that Cressy was able to stay relatively open. Absolutely. I'm always interested to talk to recent, recently drafted guys. Uh, I used to be the broadcaster in a low A level. So we would occasionally get some guys that would get up to our level the year they were drafted. That was the case for you uh, ending the season in Quad Cities last year. I mean, walk me through a little bit of just how much of a whirlwind the draft year is. I mean, you played 68 games, started every game at shortstop for Ole Miss last year. Uh, you're drafted on June the 4th while playing in the NCAA tournament. Uh, you're in a super regional on June the 10th, six days after you've been drafted. That's basically the end of the season. How do you minimize distractions during the draft process while you're also playing, you know, massively important games uh, on the doorstep of getting to the College World Series? Right. Yeah, that whole draft year is stressful. Just the whole thing, you know, you, you try to push it aside, but it's there and everyone kind of knows it. And but, you know, once you, the season starts, you kind of get in a rhythm and it's just, hey, now, you know, you're getting the, you know, the, like I said, the rhythm, you're playing ball. And, you know, it, it kind of does get pushed to the side for a while. And then, you know, come NCAA tournament time, you know, the draft's right there. So then you start, you know, worrying about the draft a little bit and you're playing in a regional and you get drafted and now you're drafted and you go play a super, you know, that's a lot of emotions going on. But um, once you're drafted, it's kind of a relief, like it's over. And so that's super regional, all of us, I mean, not that we weren't playing free before that, but it's just everything is off your shoulders. Now it's just let's go play ball. Let's go get to the World Series. So that, that definitely was a, kind of a nice thing that you were already drafted and it was over. But then, yeah, play, like I said, played every day, get drafted, go play the Super Regional that weekend, lose on the Sunday. Three days later, I'm on a flight to Houston, sign in Houston next day on a flight to New York, start playing that day. So – it's a quick turnaround, completely different lifestyle change. Just everything, everything's new. And yeah, it's a lot to adjust to, but I mean, it's what you dreamed about. So you love every second of it. Yeah. Your first official pro at bat was 10 days, you know, after you finish your collegiate career, which is crazy how quickly it, it can turn around like that. When you're in Tri-City, I mean, you're, you're with a lot of guys who are just starting the short season. It is for a lot of uh, some of them, like yourself, their first taste of pro ball. I feel like it, at first it has to be a weird feeling when you get called up to Quad Cities where you walk into a clubhouse with a bunch of guys who all were hanging out together in spring training. Maybe they've been in the org for two, three seasons together. Not that no one's friendly or anything. I mean, yeah, I admit you get acclimated right away, but that's got to be a weird feeling where I think you were, you know, one of a few, if not the only new guy to the organization that was in that quad cities clubhouse what's that like just walking in day one that's exactly it i mean i went to tri-city and it was a lot of guys just drafted or you know hadn't been in the organ that as long as other guys and you know i was i guess it was two weeks about or so and i just got settled just got to know some of the guys well and you know and then boom get called up which obviously not mad about but you know get called up and it's like all right well let's do this all over again go to another new place, new coaches, new new teammates, new living situation. And I was like, all right, well, I've done it once, so I'll do it again. And But, you know, the all the guys in quads were, like you said, they were great. Really easy to get acclimated and moving around. And um, it was a little different, like I said, because everybody kind of knew each other from spring training and then, you know, been with each other maybe a couple of years. And, but they were great. And, you know, Ray and the other coaches, they, they made it super easy to just get comfortable. And But, yeah, I think the, the hardest part about it was just, the fact that it was my first pro ball experience and you get two weeks, you just get settled. And then it's like, go do it all over again. And it's like, all right, you know, that, you know, I hope we move fast like this just takes a little bit of focus though, when it comes back to baseball, because you got a lot, all a lot going on, new place, they said new people. And ultimately though, when it's play ball, you gotta, you gotta pull all that aside and just go do what you do. Yeah. You talked about the the pressure of, of your, your draft season and, and how you just get into the rhythm and kind of focus in. You really, you know, got on a lot of people's radars with, with how you played during the conference. You hit over 400 against SEC competition last year. Uh, the Astros are, they've kind of seemed like they've picked a lot of guys who kind of 
really like hit their stride late in their college career, uh, really see it as being some real improvements that that are making them a, a really good player uh, that they can they can take something from. What clicked for you that junior season, and because you just went on basically a torrid stretch when conference play started and the SEC is kind of that that fearsome you know weekend grind every weekend week out you're, you're facing high level competition uh what kind of changes did you make or just what kind of clicked for you late in that season yeah each year from freshman year sophomore to junior year there was a lot of growth that you know I learned along the way and then going into junior year I felt really good and then to start the year I was actually really bad I mean I struggled to start my junior year I was through the first four weekends I was really frustrated and then you know, I wasn't really sure what was going on because I was seeing pitches well, just wasn't hitting them. And then one day I hit w- with our hitting coach, Mike Clement, and we went in the cage and he just said, hey, I don't care where this pitch is. I don't care what pitch it is. I don't care what I do funky. He said, I want you to hit this ball as hard as you can somewhere. And that was like the best day in the cage that I had had in a couple of weeks. And I don't know what, you know, clicked with me, but from that moment, that's when things started turning around. And I think it was just a matter of because there was a lot going on and I wanted to be, you know, a complete hitter and use all fields and hit home runs and doubles and, you know, all wanted to do all those things. And I knew I could. I think I just had the wrong mindset about it. And so we just simplified it and said, hit the ball hard. And next thing you know, got rolling and then it looked like a beach ball for a few weeks. Yeah, good stuff. I know you get asked about your baseball family a lot. Your grandpa played in the big leagues for a long time six-time all-star your your dad played in the minors your uncle got a little stint in the big leagues too all of them were old miss guys you're from oxford that's pretty cool the thing i wanted to know about it which which i hope maybe you haven't been asked as much when you're getting recruited by old miss like like what it, what, what kind of like pitch do they have to give to you like they, they tour you around the ballpark and the facilities and like what do they have that's new to show you you, you grew up around the program you, you grew to love it so much with your family ties there, you know, what, what's, what's kind of the staff's pitch to you? Obviously they, they don't want to just ignore you and assume you'll go to Ole Miss, but I'm, I'm interested what those like visits and, and meetings were like talking to a guy who's from Oxford and, and so familiar with the program. I will say that, I mean, obviously I love Ole Miss. Ole Miss was home. Ole Miss is where I wanted to go. Um, but when it comes to the recruiting process, um, especially for my dad, he said, Hey, I want you to go where you want to go. And I want uh, you to have your own perspective. So when I was younger, he didn't let me just do Ole Miss. I went and visited LSU and Vanderbilt and Louisville. And I went and did all these things because he wanted me to have a true comparison of, you know, schools, not just because it's where my family went. And not only did that just solidify that I wanted to go to Ole Miss more because they had as nice facility, as good as coaches. They were just, you know, they had all the things. So when I compared it, it made me want to go to Ole Miss just as much. And then also I'll say they did a great job of treating me like a, uh, just like a normal recruit. I mean, the number of times that they came and watched me play was probably more than any other school came and watched me play. And so, I mean, I appreciated that because they were wanting me for me, not because of any other reason. But then once, ultimately, once I committed, I mean, it was like, why did I even consider anywhere else? Because this is where I wanted to play. This is home. But no, the whole, the whole process we tried to make it as normal, the recruiting process, just so I could have my own choice. And, and it played out literally perfectly. Yeah, that's really cool. It's kind of, you know, there's a couple different ways to look at like everything that's going on right now. Like you get drafted last year, you get a chance to, to play a little bit of pro ball with, with the 62 games that you had last year. And and now we know that, that this season's basically a wash. You're not going to get game action in the minors. I mean, like, I think that's like kind of the negative way to look at it. I mean, the positive way is like, what if you were in this year's draft class? It's it's reduced to five rounds. You you only got a little bit of action in the minors last season. But, you know, if you were trying to get started now, you know, it wouldn't be till next year. So, like, I'm sure you've thought about that a little bit of like, what if just everything in your schedule was pushed back another year? Or like, what is what, what kind of goes through your head when you when you see all these kind of crazy changes happen around uh, not that it's the most important thing ever with the baseball stuff, but like that's your life. Right. <laughs> well, if this draft would have happened last year or whatever, I may not have been drafted. Because like I said, at this point, I was probably hitting 220. You know, mm-hmm. th- they didn't even start SEC play. And that's when I figured it out and got back in my rhythm. So the draft may have looked completely different for me. Um, so that's one thing that I thought about. And um, one of my buddies from Ole Miss, Anthony Stravideo, he was, I think, beginning of the third round this past draft. And I was talking to him about it a little bit, and it's just crazy because you think, hey, 
you know, you get drafted, you go play, you start your pro career. And now it's like, you, st- you get drafted, you sign, and you just wait. And it's just, it, it's, um, it's weird. And I, I have thought about it. And I don't know how I would handle it. I don't know what I would do. Do I want to go? Cause you, you know, your emotions are so high from the college season and then it's just like, you know, mellows out. So, um, no, I'm definitely thankful that we had a pretty relatively normal year, my draft year. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, talk about talking about with your teammates, you guys had eight guys drafted just last year alone. So, you know, yourself with, with the way you started last season, the other guys, you know, who knows how things would have shook out. So that's, uh, you know, that's good perspective, I think on the situation. You were the everyday shortstop at Ole Miss. We mentioned that you started every game there last season. It's just a trend in pro ball in general for a lot of guys to add to their versatility when they get into the pros. You kind of played all around the infield last season. What was that experience like for you? What was the challenge of it? Uh, And I mean, ultimately, I mean, do you kind of see into the bigger picture of just making yourself a more versatile player for for moving up the ladder? Yeah, for sure. No, I'm completely open to playing anywhere and everywhere because you know like that, that does bring you, you know, more value to yourself and um, ultimately everybody's trying to get to the big leagues everyone's good and it's what you do can to separate yourself but I'd say it was you know my entire life I've pretty much only played shortstop and not that I never felt like I couldn't play another position it's just what I did so when I got to pro ball and I started moving around it did take a little bit of an adjustment especially with all the shifts that we do I mean that was kind of a learning thing as well but I would say the the hardest part for me, which is kind of weird, maybe some people might think, was the transition from short to second. I think is harder than short to third, because just the angles of you're still on the left side of the infield. You know, the ball off the bat still similar angles, and you know your throws and everything's similar. But when you get to second, everything's different. Your angles are different to balls. You know, all your double plays are different. Your feeds are different. So I've had to find myself putting a lot of work in at second on like more fundamental stuff for like footwork, uh, just cause it's a different, different angle, like I said. So it's definitely taken a little bit of an adjustment, but I, I played enough of, you know, those other positions throughout last year where I feel comfortable where if you stick me out there, um, you know, I feel pretty good about every, wherever I'll be. What's your approach to kind of the rest of this year? Uh, you're, you're losing some, some game reps uh, and like valuable experience that it's, it's hard, impossible kind of to replace, but with a, I guess, longer off season, I don't even really know what to call it, a lost season, you know, what kind of gains or improvements can you make that you wouldn't with the long grind of maybe a season that, that you can look to for next year? So through last year, we made a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but I mean, some swing changes um, with me. And it was a lot of stuff um, that I feel really good about in the cage now, because I put a lot of work in through last year and up to this point where I feel pretty good about what I'm doing in the cage. And for me, it was a lot of, <clears throat> I need game reps because I could do it in the cage. And then I was having a hard time translating that to uh, game reps just because it's different. So in a weird way, this has been really good for me because I've been able to, so I've been doing some live ABs for I say two months now. So I've gotten a lot of at bats in a very laid back setting where I've been able to work on all these things that I've worked on in the cage without having to worry about results. And so I think in a way that's been very beneficial to me. So I plan on doing that for, you know, a little bit longer. We'll just kind of see what continues to come out about the plans for the future. But I mean, I've gotten, I mean, I don't know, I bet 60, 70 at bats or so that I've been able to work on carefree. If I punch out, if I break a bat, if I hit a home run, it doesn't matter. I can just work on what I do in the cage and it's been really good for me. And I feel really good about where I'm at. Cool. Good stuff. Last thing I got for you, I'm just going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit. Like, what have you heard about Fayetteville, Segura Stadium from some other guys that, like, you've interacted with in the org? heard it's sweet. I heard it's a good setup. I heard, uh, what was it, Fort Bragg is there. And I heard that when all those guys come out, it's going to be a fun, fun atmosphere. And no, I've heard, you know, it's very nice and good stuff. I heard nothing, nothing bad about it. All right, awesome. Again, I want to thank our guest on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast, Greg Kessinger. Uh, second round pick of the Astros last season. Yeah, great. Like, good luck to you uh, with the rest of uh, the off season and going into next year. Um, sounds like you got like a really good attitude of of using this time to improve. Maybe we'll see you in a Woodpecker's uniform down the road. Thanks for doing this. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Have a good one. 
My next guest is in his fifth season uh, with the Houston Astros organization. Started out uh, as a pitching coach in the rookie level, short season, and double-A levels. He's now in his second season as the pitching coordinator for the Astros minor league system, native of New Jersey, and a former pitcher for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, Bill Murphy, my guest on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. Uh, Bill, thanks for taking the time and being here uh, and what I'm sure you're excited now is is a much busier time uh, in your life and, and getting the opportunity to to get things going down in Houston right now. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Like you said, we just started up camp the other day. So obviously a very exciting time for all of us and something to look forward to you know, each and every day. But thank you again for having me, Matt. Yeah, no worries. I wanted to start a little bit with this, uh, just kind of how – the extended off season went for you in general. Uh, what was your experience and the challenge of kind of communicating with a lot of your players uh, in the org? And then now as you're transitioning, you know, how excited are you to be able to have that face-to-face -face interaction in person and kind of uh, getting your boots on the ground here this week, transitioning to that? So unforeseen for sure, very reliant on the other pitching coaches that we have. So we reach out to, all the players. Um, we have basically pods of players that each pitching coach is responsible for. So just making sure that everybody is safe, their families are healthy, they're not putting themselves, you know, in harm's way. If they need anything from a pitching perspective, baseballs, things like that. So just making sure that all our pitchers are taken care of and if we can assist them and, and try to better them baseball wise, doing that, but also making sure that they're they're staying safe and, and their families are okay and, and all of those things. Yeah, absolutely. What have been kind of some of your uh, early interactions uh, as you started to, to kind of greet all the players coming into camp? Uh, what's kind of just been the general vibe right now? I mean, I know it's it's a little bit different. It's a little bit unusual with the, with the safety protocols you guys have in place, but what's kind of gen the, been the general reaction of just excitement of, of getting back to baseball activity? I think a lot of people are – happy that they have some baseball, bring some normalcy back to their lives and something that you know can take them away from the day-to-day -day of the world that we live in currently, you know, for a couple hours. So it's been very positive. People have been upbeat. All the pitchers here have been great so far and have had a you know positive attitude and have been working extremely hard. So it's been a lot of fun to, to be around and going back to the field every single day for myself is, has been a real joy. So I'm very thankful to have that opportunity. No doubt about it. A lot of fans have kind of seen some glimpses into some of the major league camps and on the big league side with, with a lot of the, the guys that are working out at Minute Maid Park. Uh, you're, you know, down the road at the University of Houston at kind of the, the minor league half of the camp. What's kind of been the daily routine like so far the first few days in you know, give us a little bit of a sense of, of kind of what the day-to-day -day activities and, and operations are uh, over at U of H. We have been breaking it up into groups and you know, trying to get the guys up and running in terms of bullpens and live BPs. So just making sure that guys have the proper buildup so, you know, they are ready for the season if, if they are called upon and you know, ensuring that they get their, their daily work in because we still are trying to develop ourselves. You know, we got to a lot of young arms who are very, very talented. So still making sure that they are pushing themselves every day to try to get better and work on some of their weaknesses. So that's definitely been a major focus for us. But and we've been very lucky in that the University of Houston facility is absolutely wonderful. It's a beautiful new facility. So um, it's very gracious of them to you know allow us to work out there. But it's been top notch, you know, the last two weeks or so. Um, and all the pitchers are trending in the right direction, which is exciting. It's exciting for myself and, and Drew French, who's also the other pitching coach here. Yeah, and one of the exciting things, I mean, it's going to be this shorter, abbreviated season. Uh, there's going to be expanded rosters uh, in the majors a little bit initially. Uh, it's an area of, of strength for the, the Astros organization, just depth in the pitching ranks. So as a as a, a coach in player development, how excited are you, I guess, a little bit to, you know, pitchers aren't going to be able to go as deep into games early on in the year. So how excited are you as the pitching coordinator to be able to, you know, I guess the Astros can kind of flex their muscles a little bit, show some of the pitching depth where it's going to be 
kind of a Johnny Holstaff approach a little bit more than we're used to early in the season. Well, I'm just excited for the opportunities that, you know, the younger pitchers may get and to really show themselves. I think that that's probably the best part about being in player development is you get to watch the journey from, you know, a guy who's an A ball or rookie ball or just drafted up until the big leagues. And a lot of these guys are right on the cusp for them to be able to live out that dream pitch in the big leagues, pitch in Minute Maid Park is something that's really, really cool. Um, for instance, we had, you know, three guys who threw live BPs yesterday at Minute Maid. And, you know, just thinking about that in and of itself is like, that's the first time they've ever done that. It's a, a dream come true, but hopefully, and the conversation is like, that's the first time, but that's not going to be the last time you got to keep working. And ultimately you always want to pitch in those types of atmospheres. So. That's just some conversations that we have, but it is very exciting to, you know, see what is to come of, you know, our pitching and hopefully they can provide some, some major league wins and some major league value this year. No doubt. And and for the fans in Fayetteville, you know, there's a lot of names on the list, especially on the pitching side of, of guys that fans were just seeing at Segura Stadium last year. And now they're on the cusp of being in the majors. Uh, yeah. You mentioned those three guys who, who went up to throw the live BP uh, the other day at Minute Maid Park. Uh, Johansi Torres spent uh, a big chunk of the season uh, with the Woodpeckers. He, there's some video that was out uh, in the Houston Chronicle reporter uh, Chandler Rome of him throwing to George Springer. This is a guy, I mean, you talk about you know a guy being in single A and, and watching him every step of the way. He, he's risen through the ranks really quickly, much later of a signing than, than you can see out of the DR sometimes. And basically it's it's almost a little over two years, I think, after he signed. And now he's pitching to George Springer, live BP at Minute Maid Park. What was that opportunity like for a guy like that in general? Uh, and, and just obviously, how's he looked so electric showing up to camp so far and, and getting that opportunity? I can't speak for him, but I'm sure he was super excited. You know, dream come true. He had a bunch of smiles there yesterday. He but also, too, he's a pretty focused kid, and he looked pretty relaxed. And he threw the ball well yesterday. He has risen through the ranks very quickly. He started out and extended last year, you know, touched in quad cities for a little bit, and then threw the ball extremely well in Fayetteville last year. So it's definitely very, very exciting, and it just shows you how quick it can come. Brett Canine, who also threw yesterday, and it's it's risen for him real quick as well. He got to double A in his first full season. And then you know, Anoli Paredes threw yesterday at Minute Maid Park as well. He's on the 40 man and he was another very talented and very exciting arm that Fayetteville got to see last year. So those three guys are, are gonna have a very, very bright future and you know they just started their their journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh you mentioned Anoli Paredes too. Yeah, all three of the guys that, that were that were thrown to uh, some of the big league guys uh, this week were with Fayetteville last season. Uh, Paredes, uh, you know, what what have you kind of seen from him, the strides that he uh, took forward last season? Um, I, I've read a report where, you know, he's he's got a really kind of high energy delivery. Uh, some people would say it's a little bit, it's it's it takes a lot of effort. Some people see it in the negative side. It's a little bit harder to maintain. Uh, what have you seen from him just moving forward and especially last season um, and being able to like repeat his delivery uh, and, and in general how he looked heading into uh, into this season? I was lucky enough to actually work with Anoli when he first came over to the U.S. and he was in extended spring training. So it's been cool to watch him grow and to watch him you know, progress his career. But his delivery does have a lot of energy and that's a great thing. You know, he's got a big fastball, two really good breaking balls, and he's got the personality that is very, very exciting and, you know, big stuff to go along with it. So it'll be very interesting to see him this year and watch him harness that, which I know he can do, but the sky's the limit for him. I mean, it's huge, huge stuff, and it's a lot of, of charisma, which is a great thing. Um, so I, I really enjoy that about Anoli. And looking at the the list of the the, the player pool, a list of the guys that we'd seen that that had some uh, touch points in Fayetteville last season. Uh, Brian Abreu's first on the alphabetical list. He's a guy that's been in some discussions about maybe contending for a, a starting rotation spot. 
He's got an amazing breaking ball that we've we've I've heard some really good things about. What strides has he taken forward in the last year or so? Uh, that's really put him into a, a position to maybe be an even starting pitcher in the major leagues. Uh, and what are kind of the next steps for him uh, in in pinning down a, a potential role as a starter? Brian has a very very bright career. He's got two extremely good breaking balls. He's got some big velo as well. You know, him going from Fayetteville and then to Corpus for a majority of the year last year, and then you know debuting in the big leagues, pitching out of the bullpen in the playoffs. That's some great experience that I'm sure he'll be able to build off of this year. And you know, it it's going to be fun watching him pitch this year because of all the stuff that he has. I'm, he's another very very high makeup guy who is extremely intelligent works very hard. So, you know, it's going to be very, very fun to watch him this year. One last guy I wanted to, to mention too, he's he's with you in the minor league camp right now as, as part of the player pool. Uh, we had him as a guest on, on the podcast a couple of months back when we were just getting this going, but Sean Dubin, a uh, 24-year-old righty from New York. Uh, he led the Carolina League in strikeouts last season. He was a pitcher that a lot of fans kind of got attached to uh, playing for Fayetteville last season. Just a guy who's kind of risen quickly, but what's been uh, exciting to get to work with him going into this year? Uh, he added a bunch of weight. He was really excited to talk about uh, kind of the extra strength that he had built. Um, what have you seen from him and his development this last year and, and in camp recently? So Sean was very exciting last year. Only pitched, I believe, twice in Quad Cities. That's how good he got off to in terms of a start. And then at the end of the year in Fayetteville was absolutely tremendous. He's a guy who has gained, you know, three, four miles per hour, has been as high as 99. He's got two extremely good breaking balls as well and a change up to play off that. So I, I keep saying, I keep saying this trend, but it, it's very exciting. Like he's got big stuff as does, as does Brian, as does Joe Hanse, um, as does Anoli, as does uh, Brett Canine. So he's going to be fun to watch this year. It, Big fastball, and you know I can't say enough about the breaking balls. It, it's good. One thing too, just in general, that we, you know we've talked to, we mentioned Torres, who uh, was a, a guy that got passed over by a bunch of teams and, and signed a little later. Dubin was was maybe a little undersized at first, and, and maybe got overlooked because of that. You know, just in general, the the, the Astros are, are are so good at at developing these guys and, and maximizing their talents. They're, they're looking for guys that are good communicators like yourself to, to help that happen. But uh, what kind of about, I guess, the culture in where is that fostered and I guess the willingness to learn and how much are we maybe underrating that as, you know, almost like a sixth tool that helps these guys make it to the next level, move up so quickly and, and do well. Where does that kind of come from and, and how important is that in, in their, from, from their perspective, the player perspective? I think you said it wonderfully that they are trying to progress their career. They're trying to get better. All of those guys that you mentioned have worked extremely hard to try to learn our program, but also try to strengthen their strengths and then try to increase some things that may be a little lacking or a little bit behind their strengths. So all of those guys have worked extremely hard, you know, from the pitching side, but also in the weight room to try to develop themselves. And I do think it's a culture because when you see one guy doing really well, you try to match that. And once you get two, then you, then it goes to three and it keeps on moving forward. So um, I, I think you know, being around people who want to try to improve and being around people who are positive and who see the good in things is very, very important because baseball could be a very, very negative game. And if you can keep it positive and keep it fun, people are going to stay engaged and they're going to keep trying to improve every single day. I think that's you know a great thing that Thomas Wood said, the pitching coach in Fayetteville did last year was just being super positive. And we try to you know kind of live that every day, try to try to keep things where players enjoy what they're doing, enjoy getting better and you know, congratulating them on their development pieces. I think that goes a long way. Absolutely. Uh, when we get into the start 
uh, of the season here in a couple of weeks. You'll be transitioning and, and headed to Corpus Christi, where the, the taxi squad will be uh, staying ready, awaiting that potential call-up when as needed uh, to fill in in the majors. How do you see kind of that daily routine uh, working out uh, over at Whataburger Field when that begins? It's going to be an emphasis on development, obviously, and, and improving these players. But what what kind of things do you see being done or, or that will be done to kind of ke- uh, keep players in, I guess, game-ready shape, be ready as best they can uh, when that call uh, may or may not come at some point? Try to get them to compete on a daily basis. And like you said, trying to develop it as much as they possibly can. But, you know, pitchers need to get pitch counts in, so they need to get their pitch counts up if they break from the University of Houston and, you know, they're not ready for a starter load or reliever role. So just kind of getting arms ready for that. But then also creating the realization that you are very close, that you can get a call at, at any second and you need to be ready to go. You know, you don't want to doubt what you did for the last week when you are you know, flying to Houston or driving to Houston to pitch in your first big league game. So just making sure that you are mentally and physically prepared. So when you get your chance, you get your moment, you take full advantage of it and you're able to help the big league club be successful. All right. Shifting gears a little bit. My, the last thing I have for you, uh, you're a Rutgers guy. Uh, you're from New Jersey. Uh, one of the huge uh, gut punches to kind of the pandemic shutting down sports was we didn't get March Madness this year. I am a Wisconsin Badger alum. Rutgers basketball was having a pretty good season. They haven't been to the tournament in a little while. Do you follow your alma mater a little bit at Rutgers? Uh, I feel like that uh, is kind of a big sting. I think it extended the March Madness drought to three decades for Rutgers. How closely were you following that and were disappointed when March Madness happened? I was aware that they had a pretty good team this year. Um, it's unfortunate that they, that they couldn't have the playoffs. That was kind of sad. Hopefully they can build off it. Um, they actually just got a, a big time recruit from my high school, Rozo Catholic. So, you know, top 100 recruits. So using the season they had to you know, get some good players is definitely a big thing. I am actually a, a really big Rutgers wrestling fan. So it, it stunk that, couldn't watch the NCAA wrestling tournament, but you know, Rutgers wrestling is going to be ready to go next year. They just got a big recruit from, well, transfer recruit from Northwestern. So it's exciting. I, I really like wrestling. I do follow the basketball program um, a little bit. So it's kind of where I'm at with that. That's cool. Did you, were you a wrestler at all in, in high school or anything like that? no. I was not a wrestler at all in high school. I was a season ticket holder for Rutgers wrestling um, a year ago, and it's just really fun. I don't know if anybody's ever been to a wrestling match, but it's very exciting. Like at the snap of a finger, you can be getting your hand raised and the place is going absolutely crazy. The rack is a really cool place to to watch a sporting event. You're going to get 78,000 people. I was lucky enough. I actually went to see Rutgers Ohio State when Snyder, who was the gold medalist, um, heavyweight finalist wrestle there. So that was really, really cool. Awesome. The Big Ten is like a gauntlet for wrestling too. So that that was huge for Rutgers when, when they went to, to the Big Ten overall for, for the wrestling season tickets. That I mean, those went up went, <laughs> went up in value when that happened. Big, yeah. It's, pre- it's been pretty amazing kind of watching the, the growth of that program. They had, they had two national champs in 2019, Anthony Ashnell and, and Nick Suriano. So... That was really fun. Um, Seriano was going to take an Olympic red shirt this year, so hopefully he'll be back next year. But I'm not sure. But yeah, they've they've had a really good program and they got a lot of really good wrestlers moving forward. Cool. Again, we want to thank our guest, uh, the Astros pitching coordinator Bill Murphy. Bill, stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, looking forward to to seeing a lot of our guys in Fayetteville pitch on TV pretty soon. So thanks for doing this. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And just kind of, you know, one last thing, all the guys that you you touched on, whether it be Anoli or Johanse or Kanine or Brian, they are, you know, fantastic human beings who have worked extremely hard and you know, they have really good hearts. And it's going to be really fun to watch them this year. And I think huge, huge things are ahead for all of them. And 
Fayetteville was extremely, extremely lucky to, to watch some of those pitchers last year. And it's just going to be so much fun watching them moving forward. Thanks again to both of our guests on this week's episode. Greg Kessinger, second rounder by the Astros last year, uh, as well as Bill Murphy, the pitching coordinator for the Houston Astros system. Last thing before we wrap up, our look in at the the out-of-the-park baseball 21 season for the Woodpeckers this year. The simulation uh, that we've been progressing forward week by week as part of the podcast. Not a great week for the uh, virtual Woodpeckers, just two and three in their five games they played in this past week. They're now four games over 500 at 48 and 44 overall, including an 11 and 10 start to the second half. Woodpeckers have just kind of slumped offensively in our OOTP simulation. Uh, They have won just three of the last 10 games, still a dominant pitching staff. And in our virtual simulation where we let the Astros in the game make all of the roster decisions. Somehow, Christian Javier is still in the Carolina League, and he is absolutely shoving right now. Last four starts for Javier in the virtual season. He's gone at least six innings. He's done a seven-inning outing in three of his last four, in fact, working 27 total innings, giving up just one earned run in that stretch with 40 strikeouts. Javier is leading the 2020 Carolina League season with a 2-2-9 ERA and 110 strikeouts right now. Uh, across the Carolina League ranks, the Woodpeckers lead in a lot of the important pitching categories, pitching war, strikeouts, uh, starter ERA, and bullpen ERA. But as we mentioned, the offense has just kind of fallen off a little bit. Freudus Nova was called up to A Corpus Christi. He was kind of one of the leaders in the lineup. Luis Santana still batting 315. He's been a solid two-spot hitter. Jake Myers hitting leadoff. He provides excellent defense and is having a nice season with the bat. Corey Lee, Astros first rounder from last year in the virtual season, batting 272. He's belted a team best 11 home runs in the season. Outside of that, a few struggling guys. Uh, Woodpeckers middling in the league in terms of on base percentage. They're sixth, lead the league in batting, but fifth in OPS. They've just been in a cold slump as of late in our OOTP simulation. So as it stands, uh, after game action on July the 18th, the Woodpeckers again 48 and 44 and 11 and 10 in the second half to start out that portion of the season. We're excited for the start of the Major League Baseball season next week and in anticipation of opening day across baseball on Thursday of next week, opening night for the Astros will come on Friday. We will preview the upcoming 2020 season for the Woodpeckers Parent Club with Jake Kaplan who covers the Astros for The Athletic. We've got him lined up uh, for a conversation to preview the start of the Astros season on the podcast next week and we will hear from another Astros minor league coordinator, the fundamentals coordinator, Jason Bell, who spent a few trips last season to Fayetteville. Uh, He'll break down a lot of the Astros' top prospects uh, and their defensive abilities, uh, as, as well as some of the guys that the Woodpeckers had last season that are with uh, the Astros' spring training camp right now. So we're excited to have uh, Jason Bell on, uh, fundamentals coordinator for the Astros and Jake Kaplan uh, with The Athletic to help us preview the 2020 season for the Houston Astros next week. Again, want to encourage you to like, share, subscribe, help us grow the podcast. We've got a lot of dedicated listeners that we know are a lot of our biggest fans, season ticket holders, uh, and the likes uh, that listen in Fayetteville. Look, we know you're not seeing your usual friends of the ballpark, but reach out to them. Let them know about the podcast. Uh, biggest thing for growing it online, giving us a review. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening. Uh, We did get a new review in the last week uh, from a regular listener in Saudi Arabia. He is based in Fayetteville where he normally lives. He has Woodpeckers tickets. He left us a nice review, uh, and so it's awesome. We're going worldwide. We're in six different countries where our listeners come from right now. So that was a cool review that we had come in new. So shout out uh, to one of our regular listeners who dropped us that five-star review 
in the past week or so. So yeah, share the podcast on your social media channels. Give us a like, subscribe, uh, and uh, give us a rating too. Biggest thing uh, in terms of growing the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. So until next week, this is Matt Dean, Broadcaster Communications Coordinator for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers, signing out on episode number 10 of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast.